Hey folks, Eric Scheidel here, the HVAC service mentor. You know, heating and air conditioning service is an inherently dangerous job. In fact, just because of the sheer variety of hazards that we encounter in the field, it may be one of the most hazardous uh, skilled trades types of jobs. Certainly not to take away from all of those other dangerous jobs that are out there, but I think it pays to stop for a minute and kind of realize the fact that what we do every day and what we can tend to take for granted can be very dangerous. And one of the most uh, prevalent hazards that we face is hazards from electricity. The number one rule about how to stay safe when working on electrical equipment is to power it down, de-energize, turn off the power. But for an HVAC service technician, most of the time, that's not possible. If you're using a meter, if you're troubleshooting a circuit, if you're testing a motor, you have to have the power on and you have to be able to operate that equipment and work on that equipment safely. So stick with me for the top five tips on how to stay safe while working on energized equipment. So before we get too deep into the how to part, let's take a look at what are the hazards of working with energized equipment and working with and around electricity. The thing that comes to most people's mind, first of all, is the threat of electrocution. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, the threat of electrocution is real, but it is also rare. You're far more likely to be injured in a completely other way that you might not expect rather than being electrocuted. In fact, being electrocuted is kind of hard to do. To actually be electrocuted, you need to have a sustained current moving through your body, either from one line to the other line or from one line to ground, which means if it's in the case of a line to line electrocution, you physically with both hands have to touch both energized lines, say like on a 240 or 460 volt service, grab hold of both of them at the same time and then current will pass from one line to the other and you'll experience the full 100 percent voltage of that that is extremely rare and a little bit hard to do much much more common is the threat of electric shock electric shock and electrocution aren't exactly the same thing but they are of course related to one another in both examples you do have electric current passing through your body in the first example, it's from line to line. In the other example, it's more of a, of a tickle. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of times if we get uh, touched with a high voltage, it's instantaneous, it's brief, um, but it does have an effect. That's a shock. It's not a sustained electrocution, and they're a little bit different. So the dangers we experience from electric shock include that sudden jolt that happens. That sudden jolt can uh, tear muscles off of the bone, for example. That's a bad thing. All of the muscles will immediately tense up when you're shocked. Uh, even more specifically, it'll make your whole body jerk, which means that you can slam your head into something nearby. If you're touching something with your hand, you'll suddenly jerk your hand back and smash your elbow on something, possibly causing injury that way. But beyond electric shock, there are other hazards as well. Don't forget about falling off your ladder or falling off a roof if you're uh, being shocked as well in that jolt. Besides electric shock, there are other hazards to be concerned with as well. And the hazards from working with electricity are very similar to the hazards when working with torches or working with flame tools or welding. And that has to do with burns and um, eyes, ears, things like that. When you create an electric spark, if you accidentally short out two things together that shouldn't be shorted out, either short to ground or a line to line short right there in front of your face, a fireball erupts. Now, most of the time it's small, but the higher the voltage you're working on, the more likely that fireball is to be much bigger. And that is called an arc flash. Arc flash has the ability to burn your skin, uh, very similar to an intense immediate sunburn. It has the opportunity to damage your eyes. It can create a loud boom, which can damage your ears, and it can create burns on your skin. In fact, a uh, very high voltage arc flash, and it doesn't have to be that high, honestly. Anything above 240 volts to ground, such as one leg of 480, which is 277 volts, 
An arc flash on 277 volts is strong enough to vaporize parts of your body. So you're at risk from losing eyes, losing fingers, losing a hand, um, losing your eyesight. Those are not inconsequential. Just because you're not being electrocuted doesn't mean you can't be seriously injured. Um, so here's what we need to do to stay safe around these kinds of hazards. Number one, know what voltage you're working on and where the disconnect is. Too often it's a mistake for a technician to open the electrical compartment of a machine and just immediately start fiddling around in there without knowing exactly what voltage is present inside of that box. Read the rating plate, identify what is the proper voltage that is supposed to be in this machine and be prepared for it and know where it is before you do anything. When possible, you do want to turn the power off. For example, anytime you're working inside the power connection box on a compressor or on an electric motor, you should have the power off while you're working in there. Of course, you may want to have that compartment open while you're doing testing, but while you're opening the car apartment, while you're separating the wires, have that thing powered off and de-energized whenever possible. To go along with that, make sure you verify that the power has been safely de-energized with your electric meter. Do not trust the disconnect handle being in the off position to guarantee your safety. On older disconnects or a disconnect of any age, honestly, that has multiple poles, it is very possible for one of those, say for on a three phase disconnect, for you to close two or open two of them, but one of them will remain closed. That When that happens, every high voltage terminal in that machine has the potential to be energized. And if you think it's off, but you touch it, you will find out real quick that it was energized. So check every leg to ground and leg to leg with your meter before you touch anything. Another side note, and I guess this would be 1.5, is treat every conductor as if it was live. Even if you know that it's de-energized. Even if you've checked it with your meter, it's just a good habit to get into. It's very similar to firearm safety, right? Treat every gun as if it was loaded. Treat every wire as if it's energized. And if you do, you should be safe under all conditions. Number two, PPE. PPE stands for Personal Protective Equipment, and you should be wearing it any time that you are operating energized equipment or troubleshooting energized equipment or working anywhere around live bare terminals. The number one thing that you want to have on is your safety glasses. Now, hey, Eric, I'm not using a hammer. I'm not using a hammer drill. I'm not using power tools. Why do I need safety glasses when I'm working around electricity? The reason is this. In the event of an arc flash or a spark, molten vaporized metal that is thousands of degrees Fahrenheit immediately starts flying through the air. And that's the last thing you want to have in your eye. So wear your safety glasses. In addition to safety glasses, look into having fire resistant clothing, safety gear made by a safety company like, uh, uh, or a workwear company like Carhartt, Dickies, for example, and there are others as well that have an FR next to the name. That means these are fire rated. Remember, one of the hazards of working with electricity is from burns. So make, uh, having some fire rated gear, even if you don't wear it every day, but if you put it on before you are sticking your fingers in an energized equipment is a very good idea to help prevent burns. To go along with that, gloves. Gloves don't necessarily have to be super fancy. Leather gloves are great, but something that's going to protect your fingers and hands, which are going to be closest to the energized components from burns that could be related to an arc flash. Gloves like these work very well. Uh, latex gloves, not so much. They will melt. Essentially, if it's a glove that you can wear while soldering, it's a glove that you can wear while troubleshooting energized equipment at the typical voltages that we run into. Obviously, leather gloves are better, but a lot of guys have these gloves on all the time, and these are certainly better than nothing. Think about your feet as well. You can purchase electrical hazard rated footwear from safety shoe companies. 
not to endorse anybody, but I've been a big fan of Red Wing boots. Had a lot of pair of their boots, and they do have electric hazard rated boots as an option. If you go to their website and you look at the different safety features that you want, if you're going to combine, for example, safety toes with electric hazard rating, that actually limits your boot choices down to about three different models that they offer that have both of those safety features incorporated into them. So look into electric hazard rated footwear. What electric hazard rated foot there does is it reduces your um, uh, ability or your potential to receive an electrocution or an electric shock through to ground because there is a bit of a rated insulating layer in the footbed or in the soles of those shoes to help prevent that current flowing through the ground and just gives you a little extra measure of safety. Now that doesn't mean that you should just feel free to just go grabbing onto live conductors all the time. <laughs> Absolutely not. But in the event that a mistake does happen and they can happen, been there, done that, uh, it's a little bit of additional safety to help make sure that you get home at the end of the day. The highest level of protection is a full-on arc flash suit. Arc flash suits are normally required in some applications, and when they are, you will see a sign that says something like arc flash hazard, uh, do not enter without appropriate gear. If you need to know what is the appropriate gear, you will find the answer in the NFPA 70E uh, manual that describes what is proper protective equipment and what kind of electrical environment. For us HVAC technicians, when we do not have any other authority having jurisdiction telling us what to wear and you want to be safe under normal circumstances, anytime you're on a voltage higher than 208 volts, you should be wearing gloves, safety glasses, FR rated clothing, and uh, safety shoes. So that pretty much covers it. Number three, let someone know where you are. If you're a residential service tech, chances are that you are being dispatched by a central dispatcher on a regular basis. And chances are they should pretty much know where you are at all times, how long you're expected to be there and when you're expected to be done. And you probably know that if you're taking a little longer than expected, you're gonna start getting calls wondering, hey, what's going on? When are you gonna be moving on to your next call, right? Mrs. Jones is unhappy. If you're a commercial service technician, however, you can find yourself getting dispatched to a, uh, say, a planned maintenance job in a large building that's expected to take multiple days or a week. I used to have this all the time where I would be sent out by myself to do a prolonged planned maintenance on a building, and I wouldn't, they wouldn't expect to hear from me again for several days. So as far as anybody know, I could have been laying unconscious somewhere, and nobody would even think to look for me. Number four, be aware of your other hand. One of the vulnerable parts of the human body to electric shock and electrocution is your heart. If you have current that passes down one hand, down your arm, across your chest, down your other arm to ground, that can kill you. That can interrupt the normal electrical signals that are controlling and operating your heart. And that can lead to uh, severe complications down the road, if not even instantaneous death. So we really want to be careful of that. When you're working on energized equipment, use one hand. Old timer electricians and other mechanics used to say, put one hand in your pocket. And that's a good advice. Far too often what we like to do is we like to put one hand on the thing we're working on and well, then we're in there. Well, now you've just created a pathway from one hand to ground through your other hand across your heart. Avoid that. If you have to be working in an energized compartment, do it with only one hand and keep make sure your other hand is not grounded. This is going to help in the event that you do get shocked that the damage is going to be minimized and it's only going to be horribly uncomfortable and not life-threatening. Number five, your meter probes. Of all of the things that you could think to stick into an energized electrical compartment to say, move wires around to get a better look, things like your finger, <laughs> don't use that. Use the tool meant for it, your meter probe. Your meter probe is uh, electrically resistant. It is a stick, it has something, and it's meant to be going poking around in energized compartments. 
To go along with that, make sure that your meter probes have the accessories that you need to help stay safe. Alligator clips like this one allows you to clamp your test probe onto an energized terminal when you have the power off and then energize it and read your meter without having to actually physically touch anything. Another thing to think about is the finger guard. These finger guards are here so that when you're holding your meter probe, the ends of your tender fingertips are far enough away from energized components. For extreme conditions where you may have electrical probes that are deep inside of something, um, higher quality test leads offer meter probe extensions that can stick that another six to 10 inches out to really keep your fingers away from energized conductors. Anytime possible, I will hold my probes as far away as possible so that I am not risking the rest of my hand or fingers coming into contact with nearby energized terminals. Speaking of which also, uh, the length of your probe. You may have a uh, hot terminal and a neutral terminal right next to one another. And it might be possible for you to use the little metal probe to bridge those two together, creating an arc flash right in front of your face. Avoid sticking your face in front of it as well. So hey, those are my top five tips to stay safe while working on energized equipment. It's something that you're just going to have to do. And in order to do it comfortably and safely, if you follow these rules, you should be able to consistently and routinely make it home. By the way, if you have a colleague or somebody that you know that says something like, I've been tagged by that voltage so many times, it's not that big a deal. That is an unsafe individual. They probably have chaos everywhere they go, and you would be well advised to steer clear of that person, especially if you have to work with them. They're a hazard. <laughs> All right, folks, if you find this kind of information helpful, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to uh, hit that notification bell because we drop helpful videos like this for our friends in the HVAC service community on a regular basis, and you want to make sure that you get notified every time we do. Go to our website at www.hvacservicementor.com and look at the training opportunities we have available there, which go a lot more in depth than we can do here on YouTube. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up on our email list. Every new subscriber gets access to a free full-length training session. Hey, I'm Eric Scheidel, the HVAC Service Mentor. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.